Good afternoon and good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Noah Smith. I'm a program manager with the Office of Emergency Medical Services here at NHTSA, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. And together with our federal partners, NHTSA's Office of EMS is focused on advancing a national vision for improving emergency medical services across the country. And the projects that we undertake and the resulting resources for the community help folks like you plan for system improvements, measure the health of EMS systems, and deliver the data that EMS leaders need to advance their individual agencies. And another role of our Office of EMS is to educate the EMS community on new innovations, processes, and technologies that can, in the end, help provide better and more efficient care. And so this free webinar series hosted by our office is a unique opportunity for federal agencies to share information with the community in a manner that's a little more personal and less time consuming than attending conferences, but really offers the opportunity to interact and ask questions directly with stakeholders uh, and with the folks that we serve. So EMS Focus conducts webinars several times throughout the year on issues that are important to the EMS community and provides you with hopefully timely information on what some of our federal agency partners are doing about those issues. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be archived on www.ems.gov for future viewing and listening. Past webinars have included topics like funding opportunities for building data connections between EMS and healthcare providers, how EMS can help reduce the opioid overdose epidemic, and implementing evidence-based guidelines from paper to practice. So we really encourage you to head to ems.gov and check out the uh, archived versions of several EMS-focused webinars from the past. Of course, uh, more information on the webinar series and all of our ongoing projects here at NHTSA can be, uh, can be found at ems.gov. We are always pleased to shine a light on our federal partners, and our topic today is really a shared responsibility among so many federal agencies, state entities, national organizations, and of course, local leaders and ultimately providers in the field. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the inherent risks that EMS workers face on the job each and every day, and what's being done at the national level and local levels alike to better understand and mitigate those risks and to keep providers safe and healthy. Folks on the webinar may recall the EMS Culture of Safety Strategy that was published several years ago uh, with funding from our office at NHTSA with a cooperative agreement to the American College of Emergency Physicians. And the project identified three groups of people that are at risk for potential harm in everyday EMS activities. And those include EMS personnel, our patients, and members of the community. And we could spend an entire webinar and much, much more on each of those three topics. But today, we're going to focus on the risk of harm to EMS personnel. And more specifically, we're going to discuss risk of on-the-job injury, illness, and exposure. As we know, mental health is another extremely important piece of a provider's overall well-being and has been recognized by uh, countless organizations and the Federal Interagency Committee on Emergency Medical Services as uh, an, uh, an incredible priority for our profession. But again, there's just so much to share that we're going to reserve that topic for a later webinar. I'm really excited about today's webinar because we're going to be sharing some truly landmark research into what's hurting us and our colleagues on the job the most. And this is really never before known national information, and we're really proud to share it with you today. Since 2007, NHTSA has partnered with the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, or NIOSH, to improve injury surveillance by collecting nationally representative data about line of duty injuries within EMS. And NIOSH has improved our understanding of line of duty injuries across the nation by collecting this nationally representative data and sharing it with us in this incredible research today. Uh, it's an important component of developing a culture in which safety considerations and risk awareness permeate the full spectrum of EMS activities and decisions. We're going to share some of the key findings from a recently released report uh, on injuries among EMS personnel, which again was conducted by NIOSH, which looked at four years of EMS worker-related injury and exposure data to better understand how to prevent these issues. 
We'll also learn about the National EMS Safety Council and work done by national organizations who have come together to create a safer work environment for EMS professionals across the country. And finally, we'll hear from one, uh, we'll hear how one agency is creating a culture of safety where every member of that organization has a direct role in improving the safety of providers, person, uh, providers, their patients, and the community. Attendees are encouraged to submit questions throughout the webinar. Uh, and to do so, just click on the chat box uh, in the webinar platform during any point in the discussion, and we'll get to as many of those in the Q&A at the end of the session. Now I'm very excited to introduce our speakers for today. We have an incredible panel of speakers today to address EMS provider injuries and exposures uh, from several different perspectives. First, I'd like to introduce Audrey Reichard, uh, who uh, will tell us about some of the great research happening at the federal level. Audrey is an epidemiologist in the Division of Safety Research at NIOSH. She completed a BS in Occupational Therapy at Ohio State University and her Master's in Public Health at Emory University. Her work focuses on occupational injury surveillance. She's been involved in injury surveillance specific to EMS workers uh, for nearly a decade now. Mike Siegel was first certified as a paramedic in 1975. Uh, after years in medical transportation as a clinician, educator, administrator, and litigation consultant, Mike spent a decade as the director of risk management for a trio of healthcare facilities. Since 2006, he's been a senior loss control specialist for Markel Specialty Commercial, and he currently serves as the chairman of the National Association of EMT's Safety Committee. Brian McRae has served as the director of safety and risk management for the Richmond Ambulance Authority in Richmond, Virginia since 2009. He has well over two decades of experience in EMS and healthcare, serving in both volunteer and private ambulance services before becoming the emergency management coordinator for a Virginia hospital. And again, I'm Noah Smith. I serve as the moderator of the EMS Focus webinar series. Uh, I've also served as a volunteer EMT for over a decade and continue to practice for the Prince George's County Fire and EMS Department uh, just outside of Washington, D.C. and Maryland. So the risks we're talking about today are very real to me and to my colleagues in the Office of EMS who also serve as EMS practitioners. We're ready to learn with each of you. With that, I'll turn it over to Audrey Reichard from NIOSH to present her landmark findings on EMS worker injuries and exposures. Audrey? Thank you, Noah, and it's good to be talking to all of you. As Noah said, I'm going to be talking to you today about non-fatal injuries that occur to EMS personnel at work. I work at NIOSH, um, which is part of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. We have offices all across the U.S. that conduct research and make recommendations to prevent work-related injuries and illnesses across all industries and occupations. While we are created by the same legislation as OSHA, we do not have a regulatory role like OSHA does. I want to start by giving you a broad overview of what we currently know about non-fatal EMS injuries. Previous research has shown that over a five-year period, there were 99,400 ED-treated injuries to EMS providers. Additionally, there were 21,960 injuries that resulted in days away from work. Of course, you'll notice that there's some overlap between these because there are ED-treated injuries that result in days away from work. Finally, there are other injuries, such as those treated in doctor's offices and those that are self-treated. This is in that circle to the right, and we have no idea how many injuries are in that circle. Why is it important to know about injuries to EMS providers? Well, first, EMS providers are obviously a critical component to the ongoing health and safety of the public. Additionally, the demand for EMS workers is expected to increase 24% over the next 10 years. So we need to do more than just maintain the workforce. We actually need more workers. However, injuries are occurring and that impacts the worker retention. While this is not the only factor impacting worker retention, it is important that we address it to reduce the impact that it does have. So you can't prevent what you don't know or you don't understand. The first step in injury prevention is describing the injuries happening to the providers. However, there is no single data source that has this information and it is cost prohibitive to develop such a system. Thus, using what is available, NIOSH and NHTSA 
collaborated together to use an existing data source to study injuries occurring to EMS providers. Our study relied on a data source that collects data on non-fatal emergency department or ED treated injuries from a national sample of approximately 67 hospitals. These data are routinely collected for NIOSH. This data source was used because in addition to capturing basic surveillance data, it offers researchers the opportunity to conduct telephone interviews with workers identified in the data. We use these interviews to capture data not found in the medical records. Specifically, we collected detailed information about the worker and the injury that occurred. Our study identified and interviewed workers over a four-year time period from July of 2010 through June of 2014, and a total of 572 EMS workers completed an interview. Another unique aspect of these data are that they are sampled in a way that allows us to apply statistical weights to each worker interviewed. We use those weights to produce national estimates of EMS workers who were injured on the job and who sought care in an ED. So they have to meet both of those criteria to be in our data set. These weighted estimates are what I will be presenting on the slides. Again, based on the weighted estimates, our study found that there were about 89,000 work-related injuries that occurred to EMS providers over the four-year time period. This works out to be an average of about 22,300 injuries per year. Remember, these are only injuries where the provider sought care in the ED. Thus, this is not an estimate of all the injuries occurring to the workforce, but it is an important piece of the puzzle. Two-thirds of the injured workers were male and one-third was female. This is the same distribution between males and females that's seen among the workforce as a whole. Of the injured EMS providers, many of them tended to be younger, with 42% being less than 30 years old. Among all injured EMS workers treated in EDs, three-quarters were full-time career EMS providers. As there is no accurate count of the number of volunteer EMS providers, the injury rates we calculated are limited to career workers only. We found that career EMS workers were injured at a rate of 8.6 injuries per 100 full-time workers. This rate of injury is more than four times higher than the rate of 2.1 per 100 full-time workers in all occupations. Of the injured workers, 55% were EMTBs, 30% were paramedics, 8% were EMTIs, and 4% were first responders. This is very similar to the practice level distributions that were reported in the 2011 workforce assessment. It is also worth noting that among the injured workers, 52% had less than 10 years of experience. In summary, the workers most often injured are younger, less experienced, full-time workers. A few additional numbers about who is being injured that are worth mentioning are that 83% of the workers were injured while they were on a call, and 86% of those were on a 911 call at the time. The most common diagnosis experienced by injured EMS workers are sprains and strains. These accounted for 41% of all the injured workers. They are followed in frequency by exposures to harmful substances, which is most often exposure to blood or body fluids. Other frequent diagnoses are contusions and abrasions, punctures and lacerations, and fractures and dislocations. While we do not have an accurate severity measure, we do know that more than half of the injured workers return to work on the day of their injury or their next scheduled work day. We also know that 85% expected a full recovery from their injury. The most commonly injured parts of the body are the trunk and neck. This corresponds to the location where many sprains and strains are occurring. Other commonly injured body parts are the upper extremity, the hands, the lower extremity, and the face. The face as presented here includes the eyes and the mouth. When we look at how workers are injured, we classify the cases and contributing factors as injury events. In this study, respondents were asked to identify which injury events were related to their injury. Most respondents identified one, one injury event. However, some did not identify any injury event as the list was not completely inclusive and others identified multiple injury events. 
The most common injury event was body motion. This includes excessive physical effort, awkward body posture, and repetitive movement. The second most common event was exposure to harmful substances, and this includes needle sticks and exposures to bloodborne pathogens. The other injury events we asked about were slips, trips, and falls, motor vehicle incidents, and violence. Body motion injuries are the most common injury event, with about 25,000 occurring over the four-year period, or again, an average of about 8,000 a year. They occur at a rate of 2.6 injuries per 100 full-time career workers. We did find that the rate of body motion injuries increased to 3.3 among workers 40 years and older. We hypothesize that this is at least in part the reason, or I'm sorry, we, we hypothesize that at least in part the reason for this higher rate is due to the cumulative nature of these injuries. More than half of workers with body motion injuries missed at least one day of work. This injury event is the biggest contributor to sprain and strain, sprain and strain injuries, and those types of injuries are most frequently occurring to the trunk and neck. We did not attempt to collect the weight of the object and or the person the worker was lifting at the time of their injury, but we did collect an open-ended narrative description of the worker's injury. In these narratives, about half of the respondents injured while lifting a patient voluntarily indicated that the lift involved a patient who was heavy, overweight, or obese. We asked respondents about the types of movements they were doing at the time of the injury. Of the 90% of re respondents who were carrying, transferring, or lifting a patient and or equipment at the time of their injury, 90% of those were lifting a patient. Other activities that were related to body motion injuries were twisting, awkward postures and movements, working above shoulder level, and going up and down, up or down stairs or a curb. The second most frequent injury event was exposure to harmful substances. This most often involved needle sticks and potential exposure to bloodborne pathogens. More than half of these injuries occurred to workers who were 29 years old or younger, which is higher than the 42% represented by this age group among all ED treated injuries. The most common means of exposure were those that were identified were needle sticks and spitting, with spitting including both intentional and unintentional incidents. We realized that these two types of exposures represent only about 35%. This is because there were many less specific types of exposures that we were unable to categorize. These included instances of flailing patients, brushing up against body fluids, airborne transmission, like in meningitis, and um, carbon monoxide exposures, just to name a few. Uh, the most common substances workers were exposed to were blood and respiratory secretions. Respondents were asked to identify all parts of their bodies that were exposed. This chart shows the most common exposed areas, ranging from 17 to 23%. The skin exposures listed on here were mostly on the arms and hands. Face is limited to skin on the face, as the facial orifices are obviously listed separately here. Respondents were also asked to identify all PPE being worn at the time of exposure. The good news is that nearly all respondents were wearing gloves. The not so good news is that not many were gowned and very few were wearing eye protection. EMS providers who were wearing face shields or masks at the time of exposure was so uncommon that I couldn't even include it in this graph. The third most common injury event was slips, trips, and falls. Again, we asked respondents what types of activities they were doing at the time of the slip, trip, or fall. Just over 40% were walking on the same level, and another 40% were going up or down step, steps or a curb. Almost half of those injured in a slip, trip, or fall were pushing, pulling, lifting, or carrying something, and more than half of those were doing some sort of patient handling activity at the time of their injury. Motor vehicle incidents include injuries from collisions, sudden stops, and swerving, but they also include injuries uh, that result from being struck by a motor vehicle while outside of the vehicle. So this injury event had the highest proportion of workers missing one or more work days as a result of the injury. Most incidents involved ambulances and nearly half of the workers were in the front and nearly, or I'm sorry, nearly half of the workers were in the front and nearly half were in the patient compartment. So of those who identified wearing a seatbelt at the time of the injury, most of those were in the front compartment. Uh, about two thirds of the ambulance incidents involved the ambulance colliding with another vehicle. 
In most of these, the worker reported they were struck by the other vehicle as opposed to their ambulance striking the vehicle. Also, I think worthwhile to note is that most of the incidents, the ambulance was not running with lights and sirens. Um, and also, weather or road conditions, lighting conditions, or problems with the vehicle were rarely identified as contributing factors in the motor vehicle incidents that we looked at. Next, we have violence. That's the least common event, but we suspect this is an underestimate because like other healthcare workers, EMS providers incorrectly perceive that violence can be part of their job, and they don't consistently report violent incidents. Additionally, these were incidents serious enough to cause workers to seek care in an ED. So seeking care in an ED would be rare if it was just verbal violence by itself. So about 40% of those who reported violence had less than five years of experience on the job, and half of the violent incidents were physical only, with another 34% being physical and verbal. Very few of these incidents involved weapons of any kind. Patients were the perpetrators in nearly all the incidents. Uh, we did ask workers if they suspected the patient was intoxicated, and almost half indicated that, that they were. Um, and only 42% of the violent incidents were reported to the police. So in summary, injury, injuries continue to threaten the stability and the longevity of the EMS workforce. They impact full-time career workers most frequently, and the most common injury events are body motion and exposure to harmful substances. There were some limitations in our study, beginning with the fact that it was limited to ED-treated injuries only. EMS workers may be more likely to seek ED treatment because of the nature of the job, um, but they do seek treatment in other medical venues, and of course there is self-treatment and informal treatment by colleagues. Another limitation is that in order to be in the study, the worker had to let the ED staff know that their injury or exposure happened at work, and some workers may not indicate an injury happened at work just because they don't want their employer to know about it. Finally, there is a chance that some workers incorrectly recalled some of the details of their injury in the study. However, most of the telephone interviews we did occurred about two months out from the ED treatment date, so the time lapse was, was minimal. And the study is, was a result of the efforts of many, and um, several colleagues from NIOSH helped me complete this project, and they're listed on this slide. Marinda Gormley, who's a paramedic and PhD student at, at VCU, also actively participated in the, the many different aspects of this project. Uh, finally, Gam Wijitunga from the NHTSA Office of EMS has provided much valuable consultation throughout the life of this project. I just want to, I want to note that a scientific manuscript describing the results of this study in detail has been accepted by the Pre-Hospital Emergency Care Journal, uh, so watch for publication there. And additionally, we are planning to develop a fact sheet for employers, a trade journal article, and some other social media products uh, to help reach the actual EMS workers themselves. And finally, there's a link for the NIOSH EMS website that we have specific to EMS health and safety. This website also provides links to other EMS-related web pages and resources. And if you would like to contact me directly, my information is provided as well. So I am done with my part of the presentation. I believe they are asking folks to hold questions, but I will be happy to answer any at the end. Thank you. Thank you so much, Audrey. Really, thank you so much. We we really appreciate it. Uh, I think your your research you know, fills this huge gap in the understanding of the risks associated with uh, with the work that we do every single day in the field, right? Um, I know that I had some preconceived ideas about the scope of the problem, and you know, your study for me really captures, I think, for the first time, a truly national picture of the scope of EMS worker on the job injuries. Um, uh, I can just imagine, uh, again, as a provider for over a decade, it's pretty easy for EMS workers to file these types of incidents under you know, things that will never happen to me. Um, but seeing that over 20,000 EMS workers are being treated in emergency departments every year for injuries, illnesses, exposures uh, of varying acuity, that's really astounding to me. I think this is exactly what our community needs uh, to face these challenges head on and to improve. 
uh, and, and that's exactly what we're going to talk about uh, with our next two speakers and then in uh, some Q&A. So I'd like to introduce uh, Mike Siegel, who currently chairs the National Association of EMTs EMS Safety Committee. I also just want to take a moment to thank NAEMT for their leadership on EMS safety, uh, in particular their work with the National EMS Safety Council, which Mike is going to talk about right now. Mike, it's all yours. Well, thank you. Well, thank you, Noah. It's uh, great to be here. And on the next slide, we're going to talk about the purpose of the National EMS Safety Council, which is to ensure that patients receive emergency and mobile health care with the highest standards of safety and promote a safe and healthy work environment for all emergency and mobile health care practitioners. And how was that going to come about? Well, the National EMS Safety Council was established as a result of the 2013 National EMS Culture of Safety Strategy. It's funded by NHTSA, and it brought together the EMS stakeholder community to determine what constitutes a safe environment for EMS patients and practitioners. And to achieve that goal, they attempted to identify the challenge to achieving a safe EMS environment and create strategies to overcome that challenge. And part of that strategy, strategy was to develop a national level entity to coordinate national EMS safety efforts and serve as a repository for information, data, and other resources. The National EMS Safety Council received staff support from Rick Murray from, the, uh, from ASAP and Pam Lane and Lisa Lindsay from NAEMT and Dave Bryson from the NHTSA Office of EMS serves as an advisor to the council. On the next slide, we'll talk about the uh, particular council activities. Uh, they want to develop practical ways to implement the recommendations included in the National EMS Culture of Safety Strategy. They want to review the latest information, research, and best practices on EMS patient and practitioner safety. The council also develops and publishes consensus statements on the issues of EMS patient and practitioner safety as guidance to EMS agencies and practitioners. The council also raises awareness of the importance of EMS patient and practitioner safety within the EMS industry. It also identifies additional steps that the EMS industry can take to improve EMS patient and practitioner safety. On the next slide, we'll enumerate the various uh, participatory agencies. And what an impressive list. We have Ron Thackeray from the American Ambulance Association, Dr. Craig Manifold from ASAP, Rick Sherlock from the Association of Air Medical Services, Lee Varner from the Center for Patient Safety, Mike McAvoy from the International Association of Fire Chiefs, John Tadero from the National Association of EMS Educators, Dr. Jeff Beeson from the National Association of EMS Physicians, Jason White from the National Association of EMTs, Paul Patrick from the National Association of State EMS Officials, and we have Allison Bloom from the National EMS Management Association, Severo Rodriguez from the National Registry of EMTs, and Rob Reberg from the National Safety Council. In addition to uh, the National EMS Safety Council, we have several safety initiatives from the National Association of Emergency Medical T Technicians, which will be described on the next slide. And th they include Stay Safe on the Job, which we'll talk about in a little more detail in a second, Cross Checks for Safety, which provides medication safety cross checks cards, stretcher cross check procedure cards, and a risk assessment tool. We have the EMS Event Reporting, and it's the EMS Voluntary Event Notification Tool. And that's a program of the Center for Leadership, Innovation, and Research in EMS with sponsorship provided by the North Central EMS Institute, the National EMS Management Association, the EMS Chiefs of Canada Association, NAEMT, and the National Association of State EMS Officials. The purpose of event is to collect and aggregate data anom anonymously that deals with near misses, violence, and patient safety. The data is provided to appropriate state and federal offices and is also used to develop policies, procedures, and training. Interestingly, in the December 2016 issue of Safety and Health published by the National Safety Council, uh, these efforts were uh, described in an, in an article. 
In addition to the event reporting, uh, NAMT provides uh, significant mental health resources. There are websites, articles, research, treatment and prevention programs, assistance by phone. Uh, there's more training from NAMT on mental health issues in progress. And recently, the NAMT uh, performed a mental health survey, which was published and shows interesting things that, uh, for example, when asked, does your EMS agency provide mental health services, 46% said yes, 37% said no, 15% were unsure, and 2% said that such services were being developed. Uh, what was more compelling to me than the statistics were some of the comments that we received from the practitioners in the field who voiced concerns about the you know same old sorts of things where, hey, you know, get tough, suck it up. And if you can't take the heat, get out of the kitchen sort of things. And it's disappointing that those attitudes are still still around. Uh, we have significant health and safety resources as well. There are three pages of resources, and one of the newer ones is a patient safety and EMS white paper that has some uh, really good information. EMS is also involved with uh, fitness. We have recommended fitness guidelines, fitness tips. Uh, there's information from the Human Performance Resource Center Wellness Program, a fit responder fitness program, and information on using stretchers and cots to their full potential. We also have the uh, EMS safety course. And before we get into that, we'll go to the next slide and give you an example of the Stay Safe on the Job initiative. And it's really granular and down to people that actually do the work. You know, to stay safe on the job, you have to communicate. You have to maintain situational awareness. And if you maintain situational awareness and have constant scene size up, but you don't communicate the results of your assessment to the team, is anybody going to be safe? I think not. And that stay safe on the job. We also talk about taking care of your tools, your equipment, drive like a professional. In the insurance industry, we can tell you that we get 35 crash lawsuits for every one professional liability lawsuit that we get. And, you know, forget about the dollars and the cents for a moment. Isn't that wasteful to damage our equipment and hurt ourselves? I'll watch your back. Audrey did a great job of showing that uh, back injuries can be the result of cumulative wear and tear. If you do it, even if you do it correctly, if you do it long enough with enough load, you're subject to injury. Protect yourself from violence in an NAMT study. 52% of healthcare practitioners reported being assaulted on the job, and I would agree that those numbers are probably underreported. And lastly, take care of your body. You can't do your job well unless you're healthy. And I think we should probably add to that, take care of your body and take care of your mind um, to correlate with the mental health issues. On the next slide, we'll talk more about the NAEMT safety course. Oops. I'm sorry, I skipped, but we're going to talk about the health and safety resources. Uh, in addition, the white paper I mentioned earlier, there are three pages of general health and safety resources, and all of these NAEMT resources that I described can be found at this website and at uh, www.naemt.org. Now we'll talk about the NAEMT safety course on the next slide. Now, the purpose of the EMS safety course is to promote a culture of EMS safety and help reduce the number and intensity of injuries incurred by EMS practitioners in carrying out the work. Uh, we're on the second edition of the course, and although the chapters are entitled the same, Taking Safety to the Streets, which is an introduction, crew resource management, emergency vehicle safety, responsibilities and roadway operations, patient handling, patient practitioner, and bystander safety, personal health and conclusion, uh, it's really uh, well received and broad in scope because of the way it was put together, in addition to the seven committee members who were primarily responsible for coordinating the information into the second edition, we had the support of the NAEMT staff from J&B Learning. There were 12 subject matter experts that contributed to the work. And there were 42 
independent reviewers that gave us input as well. So we have a really wide basis and not just a, a small group of people on a committee that were putting things together. Now some other national initiatives that we'll describe on the next slide include the NAEMT Workforce Committee, which works at uh, decreasing attrition and maintaining a, an adequate number of people uh, performing in the uh, EMS environment. And that committee has a, also has a mental health subcommittee, which was responsible for this survey that I discussed. There's an NAEMT on the Hill Day in which representatives from EMS agencies across the country meet with their political leaders, senators and congressmen, to raise issues that are important for EMS practitioners. There's the EMS Safety Foundation from uh, Dr. Nadine Levick that uh, works very well with promoting safe ambulance design. There's multiple federal legislation as well as the uh, excellent NHTSA sleep and fatigue study that's going on in EMS. Uh, also, other initiatives include things like revision of ambulance manufacturing standards, federal culture of safety initiative, transportation research board, and the coalition of advanced emergency medical systems. So again, it's from the from the um, bottom up and the top down. It's becoming very clear that uh, EMS safety is in the national. Uh, front of everyone's mind, and we're ready for the next slide. More information can be uh, seen at these two websites, and if you have questions, uh, feel free to email me at your convenience, and thank you for listening. Mike, thank you so much uh, for, for that perspective. There is so much going on nationally on EMS safety. You, you said it right. Uh, clearly, EMS safety is uh, and has been, I think, for uh, for several years now, a real priority uh, for the profession, and needs to continue to be at the forefront of uh, of, of our thinking and of our improvement uh, as a profession going forward. There is so much that it can really be hard to keep track of. Um, so we want to thank you and your partners and your colleagues, uh, uh, and uh, those in other national organizations, for helping to turn those good ideas into practice. Um, and you know, while I can and actually do spend all day talking to federal colleagues and national organizations, uh, my favorite part about these webinars is that we try to partner with a local agency that's focused on the topic. And so I'm very proud to introduce Brian McCray, who leads safety and risk mitigation for the Richmond Ambulance Authority, to discuss what RAA is doing to try to mitigate some of these risks uh, for their EMS personnel. Brian? Thanks, Noah. No, certainly a on behalf of the Richmond Ambulance Authority, I appreciate the opportunity to, to talk to everybody today. Um, following Audrey and Mike, uh, we do a lot of what they say, and we're sitting here listening and thinking there's always something more to do. But when it comes to culture safety, and if you want to go to the next slide, for us, everyone has a role. And although my title is Safety and Risk Management Director, I am just a gatekeeper to, to it all. Everybody has a role here at the Richmond Ambulance Authority. And it it starts from our CEO all the way to the newest employee, and we have a group of 10 or 15 new employees going through a two-week orientation currently. Uh, in that slide, you see that we've got uh, across our board, uh, everybody participates. We've got our logistics folks who make sure that the ambulances have the proper stock and everything's in date. We have our clinicians and our providers who take care of patients, uh, taking care of themselves, our fleet maintenance folks who do a fantastic job about making sure that the ambulances are safe and ready to go and uh, that the crew should never have to worry about having a vehicle that's going to fail on them, that, that their vehicle is an important tool and, and our fleet maintenance group does a, a really good job about that. Next slide. So when we talk about culture of safety, it really is a commitment versus an investment. And what's the difference? Well, commitment says we as an agency know that our employees come first. Our labor force is what makes Richmond Ambulance Richmond Ambulance. Uh, the men and women who are out there working hard 24 hours a day, we need to make sure that we're giving them every opportunity to succeed. And that's both in education, that's in equipment, 
and that's in support should they suffer an injury or or some sort of uh, physical loss. And in that picture, you can see that it, that's everybody here at the authority. It even includes our administrative staff. Those of us behind the scenes are working hard to support uh, field operations. So it's easy to go out and say, I can write a check and invest money in widgets and tools and gadgets. But it really is making sure that our folks, when you bring those devices in or teach them opportunities to be successful and not hurt themselves is, is the long-term commitment. And that's what we're all about, is making sure that our folks are taken care of. Next slide. So how does that process start? How do we introduce the culture of safety to our new employees? Like I said, we've got a group in, and it starts with our hiring process. We want to make sure that we're getting the best folks in the door who are going to be successful. We look at their driving record. Uh, we do our state-mandated criminal history background checks. We do interviewing and critical thinking test while they're in interview process. And then we put them in new employee orientation uh, is a two week process here. We teach them the Richmond way of, of doing things. We, everything from how to lift a stretcher, we put them through emergency vehicle operations course. We do a road rally, which gives them the opportunity to navigate the streets of Richmond in a non pressure situation. Uh, so they have that head start before they hit the field. Uh, we put them through the EMS safety course. A couple years ago, our training manager and I attended that course up in Maryland and came back so impressed that we asked our bosses to make that part of orientation. So there's a full day committed to the EMS safety program here. And then they get out to the field for 22 shifts, and our field training officers work hard to make sure that they understand what they're doing and that they're safe for themselves and safe for our patients. So it, that, that getting them in the door is just a start to how we do our safety of culture here. Next slide. Injury prevention, again, uh, starts as soon as they come in the door. We do a pre-hire physical ability testing. It's a third-party service so that we know that it's validated and uh, works for what we need it to do. Um, again, the new the EMS safety course. We go over equipment during training, during the new employee orientation, uh, so that they are comfortable before they ever touch patients. Uh, and one of the things we do in injury prevention too is for those folks who maybe have a near miss with a piece of equipment, maybe it's a tip stretcher, or maybe it's a patient fail on a, a piece of equipment, we bring them back in post-incident, remediate the training, make sure that they understand what's going on, because part of the thing is this might be a process that isn't necessarily employee or crew specific. It could be something that's going on across the board, and we need our folks to tell us when they're having these near misses. And we'll talk about self-reporting in a, in a moment. That's a, a huge part of our, our culture. And then, of course, exposure and control and follow-up. Uh, as Audrey was talking earlier about exposures being part of her research project uh, process, we have those as well. Uh, when you're talking 66,000 calls a year, uh, we have our opportunities. And what we work hard to do is make sure that our folks understand what's a true exposure and what isn't, and so that we're not getting them worried about situations they don't need to, and we're here 24-7 as a designated infection control officer to answer their questions and belay their fears. So that's, that's part of our injury prevention process. Next slide. Self-reporting, just culture. Uh, that's really important and a cornerstone to everything. We want our folks to know that all the effort we took in to get them in the door from as soon as their application was received, all the background checking, all the new employee orientation and precepting, we want them to succeed. They are, they are an investment to us. They are, we are committed to them. And so we want them to be able to come to us when they have a near miss and say, hey, you know, I, I almost tipped a stretcher or maybe I, I had a med error, whatever the case may be, I didn't follow protocol exactly. And if they talk to us, we want them to know that we understand that mistakes happen. And as long as they aren't egregious mistakes, as long as they aren't something that is beyond the norm, we're going to work with them. We're going to remediate them. We're going to look at the situation. Again, it may be something that is prevalent across the board that, that needs to be addressed versus uh, a specific individual. So self-reporting and what we do with that uh, makes a difference. And it, it gives our folks the opportunity to say, okay, 
I'm not going to get terminated just because I curb checked or it, I'm not going to get terminated because I had a, a near miss and had to brake really hard at a stoplight and, and get some points in our driver monitoring program. Those are okay. We're going to work through that. We want our folks to let us know if, if they have a vehicle contact, clip mirrors. Uh, the city of Richmond certainly wasn't built for ambulances and, and large vehicles. And as we get bigger in our vehicles, space gets a little tighter. So mirror clips, hey, you know, let us know that you had a problem so that we can look to address those situations down the road. Next. Personal accountability, uh, professionalism. Uh, I'm a strong believer in, in share that with our folks that professionalism is an attitude. You can act professional whether you're a career or a volunteer provider. And you need to have the opportunity and the belief in yourself and your self-worth and pride and confidence in your abilities because if your mind isn't where it needs to be, you're opening yourself up to get injured. It only takes a split second for something bad to happen. Uh, and so when we're talking to our folks and we need them to be at the top of their game for 60, 65,000 calls in a 365 day period, that's a lot. And so they need to have a positive attitude and, and good behavior so that they're not putting themselves. And I think uh, Audrey slide mentioned a, a little bit earlier about violence. We don't want our folks to uh, have a, come to work with a problem and let that manifest in, into a relationship with the patient that gets them in trouble. Um, part of the mental well-being and we do uh, we've got a, a good program here with peer support and CISM uh, we work with our folks to make sure that they have the opportunity should they have a mental health issue that we're going to take care of them and we're going to get them point them in the right direction and, and work hard to get them back to, to being well physical well-being uh, we have a wellness committee here at Richmond Ambulance matter of fact we have a uh, garden outside that that many of our uh, employees participate in so that there's healthy eating and so those are all part of the culture and just a small part of what we do um, to make sure that our folks are, are, are good. Next slide. And so what does that all mean for us? Well it's easy to walk the walk or it's easy to talk the talk but do we walk the walk? Uh, this is a picture from uh, an ambulance crash that occurred a couple of years ago. It was a routine call, um, basic life support call. The crew was uh, out of town and uh, the operator had a, a problem. They left the road, hit a tree. Uh, one of our providers was ejected from the ambulance. The other was trapped. Um, luckily, they uh, both came out of this after a few days at the local trauma center and, and are okay and back to work. But it gave us the opportunity to look back and say, okay, we do all these things. Do they make a difference? And they do. Uh, this was Unfortunately, no matter how well you work and, and how hard you try, accidents happen, and this uh, was one of those unfortunate accidents. Uh, so that gives us the opportunity to reflect on what we do. Uh, you can always do something better. You can always learn each day, and that's one of the things that, that we work hard to. Next slide. Again, looking at the same time frame that Audrey presented earlier, uh, types of injuries that occur here, uh, sprains and strains, again, that's lifting. That shoulder injuries, uh, contusions and abrasions, uh, typically those are, are either assaults or I bumped my knee getting into the to an ambulance. Um, we have had, unfortunately, a, a couple of people end up with uh, fractures because they stepped wrong. Um, so it, it occurs. Uh, next slide. Again, location of injury where it occurs, um, trunk and neck. Uh, upper and lower back issues. The one I found interesting and, and something that, again, we had the opportunity to kind of look at a, a root cause on, uh, we saw a spike in hand injuries. And it turned out that when we moved to a different stretcher, the stretcher was a little wider than our previous stretcher. And folks were getting their hands caught uh, holding the stretcher wrong coming out of doorways. And so some remediation uh, there with our folks about reminding them proper hand position. As well as we had a couple uh, injuries where on scenes of calls, somebody would come by and go to shut a compartment door or go to shut a access door to the patient compartment and catch a catch a hand. So there were there were things there that, that offered us the ability to to tell our folks be careful. Uh, next slide. And again cause of injury. Uh, slip trips and falls was one that, that started to rise 
in this time of year in central Virginia, uh, it's wet, the leaves are on the ground, we've got uh, occasional icy weather, and so that was an opportunity to, for us to remind folks, hey, if you need to get your boots looked at, uh, because we provide footwear, we sold them, as well as working with our fleet folks, we were able to, in all our new chassis and in uh, remods, put lights, step well lights that not only looked at the step well but pointed down to the ground so that our providers, as they got out of the ambulance, uh, had a better view of, of where they were stepping. Next slide. Looking at our injury data on that same, same period, you can see that our responses, for the most part, are going up. Uh, our employee level is pretty consistent. In, it's interesting enough, um, uh, our injury rates are about the same, and, and we're probably part of that group that's in the far right circle that Audrey presented. Uh, we work with our local occupational health uh, folks as opposed to trying to, to put our folks through an emergency department. So we probably aren't in some of, some of that earlier data. Next slide. And although that says Q&A, one of the things that I, that I believe in and is real important to Richmond Ambulance is that those of us who have some resources, it's incumbent upon us to be able to share with those that don't. And we, we've heard and talked about a lot of different programs and projects here today, and there are a lot of agencies out there who don't have that access. And so if we have the opportunity to share best practices with those folks so that, that the smaller agencies who are just trying to put crews on the road and take care of their people the best they can, have the opportunity to continue to succeed to make sure that our industry moves forward. Uh, that's what we need to do. And again, no, I certainly appreciate the opportunity to talk with everybody today and uh, look forward to other presentations. Brian, thank you so much uh, for that perspective and for sharing not only what Richmond Ambulance Authority uh, is doing uh, to try to promote a culture of safety right within uh, within your organization, but also sharing your real data, but also opening up your organization to uh, to others uh, in the industry and saying, this is the number of exposures we've had, this is the number of crashes we've had, this is what we're learning from it. And I think that in and of itself is a key component to a culture of safety in emergency medical services, being that honest, being that open, uh, and sharing uh, with your colleagues is incredibly important. We have uh, just a couple minutes left in our webinar today, and we uh, certainly wanted to uh, end right at the top of the hour. And we've received a lot of great questions. Please keep submitting questions into that uh, into that questions box uh, on your webinar platform, and we'll try we'll get to as many as we can. And we'll uh, jump right into it. Um, and we'll begin with a question for Audrey uh, Reichard from NIOSH, uh, who who shared her uh, her research with us earlier on the call. The question is about, uh, in your research, how many workers are actually completing the phone interviews uh, when you're calling them back after they were uh, seeking care in the emergency department? And, and that might mean um, what was the sort of response rate once you were trying to get in touch with them after they left the emergency department, but also if you're able to share sort of what your original uh, uh, numbers were for the number of folks who you contacted, we'd appreciate that too. Sure, I'll try to keep it short and sweet because this is actually a very complex issue, but to and it will be in detail in the published manuscript that I mentioned. But it, in short, we did have 572 workers who completed the interview. So we started out um, every week I received a submission of the data we were using and I looked at a group of cases that were identified as potential EMS cases. And I, from those, I tried to tease apart the ones that I felt were 75% likely to be EMS workers. Um, from then, we, from there, we would send them letters and give them calls to find, and we added screening questions at the beginning of the call to find out if they truly were EMS workers. But what I can say, so from that initial identification process, we identified about 1,600 EMS workers over the, the entire four-year period. Now, again, some of those 1,600 ended up not being EMS workers, so they screened out. We actually have a few other issues in the surveillance system, too. We have a few hospitals that don't release contact information, so while they were considered part of the sample, we were never able to contact them because we didn't get their information. Uh, there's also issues of um, hospitals having incorrect contact information, or it, as one of the big problems in this day and age with um, 
telephone interviews is the, the caller ID, and people just would not answer because it was an unrecognized number. So I'm going to give you two total overall response rate overall rates of response. One is if you if you don't account for any of that, we just had a flat 37% response rate. However, if you look at the workers that we were actually able to contact um, and and talk to on the phone, um, almost three quarters of those agreed to cooperate so we and participated in the entire telephone interview. So we had about a 75% cooperation rate. That's, that's excellent. Thank you, Audrey, so much. I'm not sure if folks can tell, but Audrey is an expert in this stuff. Uh, our next question, I'm going to start with Brian and get his perspective, and then I'll open it up to Mike and Audrey as well. Uh, and that's a question about technological solutions to what is clearly a very difficult uh, challenge in the industry. Um, so. Uh, Technological solutions like uh, uh, new ambulance designs uh, that have safety in mind uh, or power stretchers or safer medical equipment, um, have those helped to prevent or reduce the number of injuries that you're seeing in, uh, in for Brian, for, uh, for the providers that, uh, that you work with at RAA? Um, and, you know, how does technology fit into the bigger picture of safety? So we'll start with Brian and then Mike and then Audrey. Sure, thanks, so. Technology, yes, uh, we are lucky and, and have some resources. We do have power stretchers, and, and uh, that made a, a difference in our back injuries for lifting patients. Um, we're working with our fleet folks on aimless design. One of the things that, that we truly believe in is making sure that not only as you move forward with technology, but you want to make sure that your folks are using what they have the right way to start with, uh, training them on on proper vehicle operation. You can design the, uh, a tank for an ambulance, but there's still occasionally going to be crashes. And so we need to make sure that the folks operating the ambulance are doing like they're supposed to and the, the providers and the patient compartment are, are staying belted and that we've had the opportunity to put committees together using field providers, the end user, to redesign where equipment is placed. So we may not have the, the up most technologically advanced ambulance, but it's a sturdy ambulance and it's a well-crafted ambulance and it gives the opportunity for the provider to sit and reach what they need to to do patient care. So technology for us as a resource, uh, having the advantage of resources has made a difference, but we also work with the basics and remediating the basics uh, to take care of our providers. Thanks, Brian. Uh, Mike, and some of the national perspective from NEMT and others, uh, what do you think about the role of technology in, in reducing our injury and exposure rates? Mike? You with us? All right, we'll move oh, on to Audrey. Can, uh, can, you, oh, can you hear me there now? There we go. Yes, Mike, hello. Where to go? I'm sorry. Yeah, technology is great as long as it's part of a process that in, incorporates it into a systematic approach. For example, we've had clients that have purchased power cots and pretty much stopped thinking. You know, they forget that the power cots are heavier than the regular cots, and gee, when do you take the stretcher to the patient? When do you take the patient to the stretcher? And just because you have power cots doesn't obviate the needs for a lift assist or for the use of secondary devices like lateral transfer aids, stair chairs, and the like. Fantastic. And Audrey, uh, any thoughts before we before we close the webinar today? Um, I would just say that I, I agree. Technology is great. Uh, at engin engineering out the problem is usually the first line of defense that we look at when we look at prevention. Um, and I'll echo what both Mike and Brian said, that, you know, the technology is great, but you also have the training. And there's research out there that shows that if you want your workers to use the equipment correctly, or even use it at all, the, the training part is key. Absolutely. Uh, we, we could not agree more here at NHTSA. Uh, and uh, with that, it is the top of the hour, and we wanted to bring our webinar to a close, knowing that there are several questions that we were not able to get to, uh, and that this should hopefully just be the beginning or continuation of a really great discussion uh, among each of the folks on the phone and uh, a bunch of uh, federal agencies, national organizations, state agencies, and, and local agencies as well 
on how to make sure our EMS practitioners are as safe and healthy as possibly can be. I want to thank uh, Audrey Reichard from NIOSH, uh, Mike Siegel from the National Association of EMTs, and Brian McRae from the Richmond Ambulance Authority for helping us out today and sharing their perspectives. Uh, this webinar and the slides will be available on EMS.gov as soon as we uh, possibly can get it up uh, online. And you should all feel free to contact us uh, if there are any questions or if you'd like to continue the discussion. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your day.